Hello. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi. Wonderful that you're joining us. Uh, we are here That's on top fun. of the Salesforce Tower at the Institute um, and are eager to discuss machine consciousness and how it ties into your work uh, today. And uh, to get us started with a question on that, what is the relationship between consciousness and self-organization that you see? Um, you're addressing me? Yes. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, well, uh, through our study of uh, self-assembly of the kinds of... <laughs> Sorry? Oh, good. <laughs> Sorry, this was a little technical, technical issue. <laughs> All right. Well, um, so, so self-organization, you know, the process that uh, each of us went through to uh, become the kind of uh, highly uh, complex and cognitive thing that we are, started as a little blob of chemistry and physics, a uh, little, um, little unfertilized oocyte. We all start life as, as this one kind of uh, quiescent cell, and then there's this remarkable process of, of self-assembly. But what's interesting about this process and what I think is uh, really, really key to uh, the aspect of consciousness that this being is going to enjoy is some interesting features that do not, at least currently, do not feature in the kinds of machines that we make. For example, one of the things that uh, this, this creature has to do is continuously uh, orchestrate a, an alignment between its uh, competent parts. All, we are made of cells. Each of our cells has its own agenda. They have learning capacity. They have goals. They have various uh, capabilities and other um, kinds of uh, problem spaces and physiological space, metabolic space, and of course, anatomical morphous space. And so if you're going to be an embryo, one of the things you need to do is to convince all of these other beings, which by themselves have their own life. And I could show you if you want, I could show you some, uh, some, some uh, videos of this. Yes, um, please. Your goal, your goal is to uh, your goal is to convince uh, these other beings that they need to all obey uh, and buy into the same model of this this journey that they're going to undertake in the anatomical space. And so, as as a as a conscious being, you are made of competent parts which can defect at any time. In fact, this happens uh, in adulthood. It's called cancer, which is basically this kind of um, dissociative disorder of the of the somatic intelligence. You need, to, uh, you need to continuously distort their option space so that the things they do are actually, uh, 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 actually supportive of the higher level goals that you're going to have. You need to figure out where your borders are. You don't know where you end and the outside world begins. This is not given to you. You have to uh, estimate this and derive this. So, um, so you're made of this agential material. You don't really know where, where your, um, the, the, the edges of yourself are. Um, interestingly, you are made of a very unreliable substrate. This is quite different than um, how we currently do our, our computer technology, where we have uh, these uh, error correcting codes and we have abstraction layers. And when you you know code in a high level language, you don't need to think about the, the silicon and the copper and, and, and these things. But life is not like that. Uh, nobody tells you what your memories mean. You have to guess yourself. You have to confabulate constantly to create uh, the best story you can out of your genetic um, prompts, out of your uh, memory traces and your engrams and so on. And so this is uh, that, that process of self-organization, the, the continuous process of revising, telling, telling the best story you can about what your memories mean and um, uh, continuously using that story to align your parts towards some kind of journey in the spaces is, is I think absolutely key to serving as a vehicle uh, for, uh, for consciousness, serving as an interface for, um, for patterns that we, call, that we call consciousness. And uh, I'll just show you, I'll show you real quick a couple of uh, interesting, uh, let's see. Yeah. So this right here, this is this is a single cell. Okay, it's called a lacrimaria, but you get you get the idea. We we are made of individual cells. There's no brain. There's no nervous system. But uh, it has lots of capabilities. Uh, soft body uh, robotics people generally uh, drool when they see something like this. We don't have anything uh, even you know even approaching this this level of competency. Um, and uh, and and even this thing itself is made of molecular networks that themselves, so not just the cells, but actually the molecular networks inside of them, things like this, have six different kinds of learning capacity, including uh, Pavlovian conditioning. And uh, this is uh, things we're doing in our lab to actually train the molecular networks, and it has all kinds of applications to drug conditioning and things like that. So uh, there are these competencies at, um, at every level. 
and this material uh, has to. Uh, this is uh, this is this is the kind of journey that uh, that we take here, right? We start as this this little um, yeah this little, little chem chemical uh, chemical soup, and it self assembles into into something like this, or maybe even something like this. It's not the end of the journey. There are many other uh, other options um, that we can take, and in particular. One thing we cannot do is, as we look at a cell, at a, as a at an embryonic blastoderm, is to say how many individuals there are here. Normally, there's one. That's the default scenario. But if you take a little needle, and I used to do this in grad school with uh, duck embryos, you make some scratches. Each one of these areas, when it doesn't feel the presence of the others, will self-organize into a separate embryo, and then you get either conjoined or not, you get twins, triplets, and, and so on. And each one of these embryos has to decide where do I end and where does the next embryo begin or the outside world. And so this, this, the, 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 the question of the capacity, the carrying capacity, how many individuals are in this excitable medium is not known in advance. It's not set by genetics. It's anywhere from zero to maybe a dozen or so. Um, and this has many implications for uh, also the, 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 the similar kind of questions in, in cognition, including dissociative identity disorders and so on. So this is this is the basic uh, the basic story of uh, the the self organization that houses uh, consciousness, and I think these things are key to uh, to that uh, process. So where does consciousness end? Where does it begin? Which systems in nature are conscious? And how do you distinguish uh, consciousness from mere individuation? Or is consciousness the force behind individuation? Does it make sense to differentiate the two? Yeah, um, so, so I, to, to, I, I think that all of the interesting features in these questions are continuous. I don't think they're binary. I don't think there are binary categories here. I don't think it makes sense to ask what is or isn't conscious, uh, I think like with all of the other kinds of things we like to talk about here in terms of cognitive properties, I think the right answer is what uh, the right question is what kind and how much. And so I would say that uh, the, what's what's important here is that when it, uh, this, this, this is this is I think I think important to say, uh, we don't I, I don't I don't think we create uh, conscious beings whether by embryogenesis or uh, engineering AI or making the hybrids and cyborgs and these things that we make in our lab. I don't think any of this makes consciousness. I think what we make are uh, interfaces or pointers into a, a, a space. You can call it a platonic space. It contains low agency things like facts about uh, prime numbers and those kinds of things, but also um, um, very complex active high agency patterns that we recognize as uh, kinds of minds. And I think that consciousness is what it looks like from the inside of that space looking out into the interface. And when we do third person science and behavioral uh, characterization and so on, we're looking at it from the, from the, from the side of the, of the interfaces. But I think uh, even, even extremely simple, uh, extremely simple interfaces. I mean, we've done we've done things with very simple deterministic models, even even things like uh, sorting algorithms. And never mind, uh, you know, language models. Even just just even sorting algorithms have unexpected competencies that no one had noticed because you don't see them in the algorithm themselves. And I think our understanding of what kind of interfaces are sufficient to allow the ingression of what kind of minds is very poor. And this is this is something that uh, that that we are constantly surprised about how even extremely simple systems can serve as interfaces for unexpected uh, behavioral competencies. And so I would say that I would say that it I, I think it goes all the way uh, down. I think what's what's really interesting now in the research program that we and others are um, undertaking is working out the scaling. So what is it that uh, that uh, how, how how is it that these interfaces from the from the simplest uh, um, uh, yeah, the, 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 you don't have to be alive. You don't have to be complex. Uh, it starts very, uh, you know, in, in, in the extremely simple systems. How it uh, scales up to allow the ingression of in increasingly more complex forms, eventually ones that uh, we would recognize as human minds, but also other very exotic minds. And I also think that um, for basically for the exact same reasons that uh, you would extend consciousness to me and each other, in other words, the problem of other minds, we have to take very seriously that uh, there are other other structures and organs in our body that meet all the same, basically all the same criteria. And if we think about it a little a little further, it actually extends, ex you know, extends quite quite far down by very similar criteria. So I, th I, th I think it's a I think it's a it's a it's a spectrum. 
Yeah, I love the radicalism of your perspective. <laughs> Um, what kind of experiments would you suggest to fi figure out whether something is conscious and how would you distinguish this from self-organization? Do you think that there is some kind of threshold thing at which point, for instance, a system is uh, realizing that it's doing something where it becomes sentient, where it's establishing some kind of a representation of uh, the relationship that it has to its environment? Well, I think there are interesting waypoints along the continuum uh, where the interesting uh, metacognitive capacities appear and, and, and language and things like you can you, you have systems that know they have a goal as opposed to simply having goals. Um, so there are interesting waypoints along the continuum, but I really do think it's a it's a continuum. I, I don't think there are any useful binaries here. And I think that uh, the other thing about the study of consciousness, is I don't think it can be done entirely in third person. So I think you can study uh, behavior and, cog and intelligence and cognitive capacities and all, all of those things you can study in third person, which means that uh, you can you, you, you as the investigator are the same at the start of the experiment and at the end, nothing happened to you. you maybe you learn some things, but, uh, but overall you've sort of remained invariant. I'm not sure you can study consciousness this way. I think uh, to really study consciousness as, as distinct from physiology and behavior, I think that uh, you are going to, in an important way, become part of the experiment. And uh, the kinds of things that, that on, on the sort of the third person science side that we would like to do, uh, that, that I think, well, is, is the research agenda here, is to really understand better the mapping, the mapping between the physical uh, interfaces that we make. So these are machines, cells, biobots, hybrids, uh, embryos, uh, AIs, embedded robotics, whatever, between these interfaces and the actual space of patterns from which they, they allow ingressions. And the structure of that space, the contents of that space, and the mapping between the pointers we build and what it is that, uh, that you get is, uh, I think, essential um, from, from this end to understand what, what kinds of minds you're going to get, which tells you something about the kind of consciousness. But if you, if you really want to understand consciousness per se, then I think what we're talking about is uh, the development of interfaces that bind you as the experimenter with other, uh, other systems in very unconventional collective intelligences. I mean, I, I, I claim that all intelligence is collective intelligence. We're all made of parts. Certainly in biology, this is true. Um, and, uh, and, and, and yeah, if you, if you really want to understand uh, the consciousness of, of what you've pulled down, we are going to have to develop interfaces, rich, rich experiential interfaces that bind diverse systems, uh, and I mean really diverse, not just not just you and and uh, other biological brains, but uh, things that are, you know, the xenobots that we build, the um, uh, things, uh, simulated uh, simulated things running on, on computers, patterns within cellular automata, uh, mathematical objects, uh, you know, the, these sorts of things. Develop interfaces where you can... Um, uh, have a have a have a joint cognitive system with these things in the same way that uh, some people have um, proposed that that our, our you know our our architectures is basically a network that's good at doing things and then a language model on top that tries to tell stories about what's what's actually going on right so this kind of joint uh, diverse joint um, system. Uh, collective so, uh, intelligence needs to start with something, right? At some point, you don't have a collective yet. You need to build this up on the ground, so there's a starting point. Also, when we look at, say, artificial life experiments in computer science, where people are uh, using, for instance, evolutionary algorithms to create little critters on the screen, uh, we can observe some self-organization going on, but uh, I think that on the spectrum of consciousness, they're still at zero. Right, there is uh, probably nothing that what it's like to be such a pattern at this point. And so the interesting question is if we can uh, detect something uh, beyond uh, such beginnings where you clearly have zero. And um, would you see your scope for an experiment? What would be the face most favorite experiment that you would, could come up with? What would the scope look like? Um, how many people would be involved? How long would this take? What would be the metric by which you say that you succeed? Yeah. Um, well, uh, so 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 first, let me. Uh, you, I just want to um, address for a moment uh, this your your point about the kind of the the lowest end of the spectrum. I'll just give you a little bit of a little bit of data, and this is stuff that uh, is is out in preprint form. So uh, the 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 peer reviewed paper is going to be out in a couple of weeks. Uh, if you make if you if you sim, if you um, create models of gene regulatory networks, 
So these are extremely simple things, maybe 10 different chemicals. Um, uh, they turn each other on and off. Uh, uh, there's a system of ordinary differential equations that describes how they turn each other on and off. J just that alone. The first thing you find out is that that by itself, no cell, no evolution, no none, none of no no brains, no, none, none of the other things that we've uh, that we come to associate with uh, with with cognition. That that thing by itself is capable of six different kinds of learning, including Pavlovian conditioning. Okay, that's a free gift from the math. But the other interesting thing about it is that we just discovered fairly recently is that as you train it, meaning give it stimuli and, and watch it do the things that we study in behavior science, so habituation, sensitization, uh, associative learning, uh, it can, they can count to small numbers and so on. As you, as you train them, one of the things that goes up is um, uh, 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 integrated, uh, the, the integrated information of the system goes up. So, so with learning, the more, the more they learn, the more integrated they get. If you force them to forget, if you give them stimuli that cause them to forget what they've learned, the integration does not drop down. So it's a kind of weird ratchet that, that moves in one direction that the more, they, um, the more they are trained and the more they learn, the more, the more highly integrated the system gets. And, you know, uh, I mean, you don't, you don't, the, the integrated information metrics are not the end all and be all of, of, of consciousness research, obviously, but um, I think it is very interesting that even the kinds of things that uh, are present in an abiotic world, or at least a prebiotic world, are already on their way to uh, a learn and 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 we think I, I can't prove this yet, but but soon we'll have data on this. Actually, potentiate their own evolvability, but also they raise uh, their their integrated information goes up. They become they become a more a more um, a high level causal system. And so I think this stuff uh, that that's a that's a that's a ratchet that I think um, starts off very very early, and it's really easy to see how because because of the way the math works out and the, and the fact that it's asymmetric, uh, it's easy to see how this will potentiate itself up and up in a, in a wide range of circumstances. So, uh, so so anyway, so that's so that's that's uh, that's about the uh, the, the start of things. Um, as far as as far as the experiments, I mean, I really think that it's it's what I was saying a minute ago that. We need to we need to develop uh, translator interfaces, rich translator interfaces that allow uh, that allow us uh, to experience being part of a collective intelligence from the inside. And it's tricky because because you don't get to find out what its consciousness is. The collective system gets to find out what its consciousness the consciousness is like if we do this correctly. But you know, this is this is now quite doable. We have in our lab, we're setting up um, systems that that combine uh, different kinds of uh, different kinds of AI, different uh, biologicals, things that are not biological, so patterns and excitable media together with xenobots. We can make all sorts of rich systems, and eventually, you can you can certainly plug plug humans into this. And so, I'm thinking this is this is an effort that's uh, probably you know five to 10 postdocs and engineers, something like that. It's not incredibly expensive. Um, and I think, uh, I think within a few years, we could have interfaces that, uh, to whatever extent as possible, would allow you to uh, participate in the consciousness of radically different beings. I mean, completely different things, some of which have never been on, on Earth before. And, uh, and, and I think from the inside, experientially, is how, uh, is how we're going to learn um, uh, what, what kind of consciousness uh, various, uh, various systems have. Amazing. And Jimmy, thank you so much, Mike. Thank you thank so much. Thank you. And have a really nice rest of your day. Okay, thank you. Thank Bye. You. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay.